globally that claim they're followers of Jesus Christ, different cultures, different ways. But, but one of the things, despite those 45,000 or 200 in this country, there are two universal principles that will exist in every one of those churches that have existed literally for the last 2,000 years of Christian history. The first one of those, and actually I should say this, both of those were actually going to practice here today in our first Sunday in the Nicola Theater. The first of those is communion. Communion is practiced in every church, no matter what denomination, no matter what nationality, communion has been a part of it. And the second one is what we're also going to do later today, called baptism. And, and, and here's the thing about that. Even though every church that has existed has performed baptisms and communions, there's a lot of disagreement on how that should go. There's a lot of difference about who should do that. There's a lot of differences about when they should do that as well, as if somehow we know more than God, right? And, and I find it interesting that that's how we, we fight over those things. And, and you know, again, I, I don't want to step on any of this tradition, but when it comes to both these sacraments that we call baptism and communion, when it comes to who can do it, can anyone do it? Should it only be just a few? In some denominations, it's just the men that can take communion. Um, sometimes it's, you know, only people, they have to take a class, or they have to be confirmed, you have to be a member, there's all kinds of rules as to why, or when, who can do that. How about when, when it comes to communion? You know, do you do it every week? Do you do it once a quarter? Do you do it on Sunday morning? Do you do it in small groups? Do you only do it in mass? When it comes to baptism, when do you get baptized? Do you get baptized as a baby? Do you get baptized as a believer? Do you get baptized right before death? There's a, a group of people that they wait to get baptized until right before they're, they're dead, which I don't quite understand that. How about how we do those things? When it comes to communion, do we use wine? Do we use juice? Do we use regular bread? Do we use unleavened bread? Do we only do it by the pastor? Do we do it by the deacon? How about when it comes to baptism? Do we sprinkle them? Do we dunk them? Do we have a priest do it? Do we have fresh water, holy water? Do we use Mountain Dew? Okay, I'm just, I'm just making stuff up at this point. But now you can understand why there are 45,000 different denominations when it comes to these two very simple sacraments of communion and baptism. And today, again, I'm not here to step on anyone's tradition, but I just want to challenge this. Instead of debating who can and who can't, instead of arguing about what we should or shouldn't do these two things, instead of fighting about how we should do that or how we should not do it, what I want to focus on today is the because I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and we always did these things. And sometimes I think we get so familiar with communion and baptism that we forget the why. Because the why is so critically important. And when it comes to communion, which we're going to take together at the end of our gathering today, the why is very simple. It's one word. To remember. Jesus Christ, on the night he betrayed, gave us the gift of communion. He said, every time you do this, I want you to do what, church? Remember, that was pretty weak. I know this is new, right? New environment, but let's try this again. Jesus wants us to do what, church? Remember. That was better. He wants us to remember that God in human skin loved us so much that he came as a little tiny baby. He grew up and lived a perfect, sinless life and shook us away with the Father. And he was wrongly accused, wrongly betrayed, hung on a cross for you and for me so that we could have the gift of salvation. And in three days, he rose from the dead, defeating death forever and establishing his kingdom on earth, which he will one day return and set everything right. And in the meantime, we're going to take communion together. To do what, church? To remember that thing. And so today, for the rest of our time together, we're going to unpack that other sacrament that we talked about, baptism, which I mentioned that we're going to do today. So in your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 3. If you're a guest, we'd love you to always bring your Bible. We believe it's God's Word. It's our authority. If you don't have a Bible, we have some in the lobby. We'd love to give you one. You can also download a new version. It's a free app on any smartphone or device. You can download it right now. But go to Luke chapter 3. We're going to talk today about the origins of baptism. Where baptism came from. I don't know how many superhero movie friends, fans we have in here, but, you know, superheroes, they always have the origin story, how Spider-Man became Spider-Man, how Superman became Superman. So today is kind of the origin story of baptism. Luke chapter 3, I'm going to start with the first verse. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, when Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee 
His brother Philip, the tetrarch of Arturo and Traconius and Lysidius, tetrarch of Albania, during the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas. Now, if you're new to God's word, this might not make a lot of sense while we're talking about that. I want to stop right there and unpack something for you. First thing you need to understand is when you come to God's word, you come to a word you don't know how to pronounce, just say it with authority. Nobody else wants to not say it either, okay? So it's not just, it's just to be okay with that. But the second thing is so important. Why are these things listed? Why are in our world today, there is a myth that exists. And this is the myth. That somehow the Bible was made up. Hundreds of years after Jesus, they just made up a bunch of stuff. And none of it's really actually what Jesus said. Everybody look right here. I'm not here to argue that. What I'm saying is they haven't done their homework. Why does Luke put these names in here specifically? To tell you that these are real people who actually existed. In a real time. In a real place. And that's why he showed us. This picture that we show up here right now. This is the Caiaphas Ossuary. It was discovered in 1990. Actually, it says on it, this is the name of Caiaphas, the high priest that Luke names here, was a high priest in the first century in Jerusalem. We have archaeological evidence that proves what Luke just said. Let me give you another example. Um, if I were to say that, you know, you remember when Ronald Reagan was president? You remember when Bill Jankel was governor of South Dakota the first time? You remember when Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were dominating the NBA? What era am I talking about? Anybody know the 19 what? 80s, good job, right? You know that immediately. If I were to say, like, Bill Clinton was president and Bill Jankel was governor the second time in South Dakota and Michael Jordan was dominating the NBA, what, what decade am I talking about? The what? That's what Luke's doing here. He used real people in a real place that his audience in that first century would go, oh yeah, I remember Caiaphas, yeah, when he was a high priest. That's when that happened. Now, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, that, should, that alone should convince you to follow Jesus Christ, okay? But if you're not there yet, I'm not asking you to give your life to Jesus just yet. What I'm saying is, what is written here actually happened. These are real people in a real time, in a real place that existed. And Luke is about to introduce us to one more of these people. Luke chapter 3, verse 2, again. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this is where a man steps on the page of history, and we know him as John the Baptist, right? Now, not John the Methodist or John the Presbyterian. Or John, okay, that, no, that's later. His name was actually John the Baptizer. That's how we know John, because he used to baptize people. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four dudes who wrote about Jesus, all talk about the significance of John's ministry. When you have four separate archaeological accounts listing the same person, you know this guy was real. You know he existed. In fact, Jesus would go on to say that of born of women, no one has been born greater than John the Baptist. But here's what I think we miss about John the Baptist. And again, I grew up in church my whole life. John didn't just get people wet and then they walk away and go on with their life. That was not John's purpose. It wasn't even his point. It wasn't what, baptism was so much more than that. Look at what Luke says in chapter 3. I'm going to be in the 10th verse. People would come to John and be baptized, but they would say, What should we do then? The crowd asked. John would answer, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one that has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than what you're required to be told. And then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? John replied, don't extort money. And don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. John didn't simply just get people wet and say, okay, go on with your life. Baptism was far more significant than that. See, he, John was saying, don't cheat your fellow humans. John was saying, don't be greedy in life. Live your life not for stuff and for gain, but for purpose. Think of others' needs ahead of your own. Baptism was so much more than getting wet. It was a symbol of life change. And I want to give you a statement about baptism that I hope you brought. You have a way to write it down. If you don't have a way to write it down, put it on your notes. Type it in your phone. This is what I want you to walk away with today if you forget everything else I say. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward decision. 
I'm going to say that one more time. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward decision. On my finger right here, you might not be able to see it, but I have a wedding ring. On June 16, 2001, I got the date right, my wife is in the room, okay? <laughs> I stood before my friends and my family in Mitchell Wesleyan Church in Mitchell, South Dakota. And I put my finger as an outward symbol of an inward decision that I made to be married. And look, this is why your baptism needs to be public. This is why we're going out to live now. All of you, even if you're not getting baptized, I hope you're going to make the trip out. We're going to feed you, and that's just a price. We want you to be out there for food, okay? But I hope you come out there because we want to make it public. We want people to see that. Just like a wedding is public, so a baptism is. But everybody understand this. When Elaine and I said I do back in 2001, we didn't high-five each other and say, okay, good luck with life, and then go off and live our own life. That would be ridiculous because we wouldn't actually be married. We got to have them baptism all the time, doesn't it? People will get baptized and we never see them again. See, I've been a pastor um, for almost 10 years now. I was in Sioux Falls, as many of you know, um, uh, for about uh, six years being up there. And I just want to say something. I, and I'm not trying to brag. I've baptized probably hundreds of people. I've been part of many, many baptisms. And I wish I would have written down all the people that I baptized because it makes me sad because I don't know where they're at. And, and because here's what I'm saying. Baptism is not just getting wet and going on and going off with your life. It's a commitment. It's a marriage. I've had to make the decision to be married to Elaine every single day when I wake up. Is that always easy? <laughs> easy for me, not so easy for her sometimes, right? <laughs> but that's what it means. Baptism says, listen, your life should change. There should be something different about you. Baptism is so much more than just getting wet. You don't go back to your old ways, your selfish nature. You leave that behind. Baptism is the death. It symbolizes the death and the resurrection to new life that we can have in Christ. That's why baptism is so important. It is an outward symbol of an inward decision. But before we go on, I need to stop for a minute. And there are two myths about baptism that we really need to unpack before we talk about anything else. Because I hear these all the time. And, and, and this is the first one is that baptism removes my sin. Okay? Remember I said before, there's a whole denomination of people that they wait until they're almost dead before they get baptized. So they think if they sit again, they're going to be in trouble. Okay, That's not what God's Word says. Baptism is not to remove your sins. And I can prove it to you. Stay in Luke, but I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew describes the moment that Jesus got baptized. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you come to me, Jesus replied. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do so to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Did you catch it? Jesus Christ, God in human sin, who was perfect, who knew no sin, came to John and said, I need to be baptized. Baptism is not about your removal of sin. See, Jesus would be tempted in every way that we were, yet he chose righteousness every single time. Which brings us to the second myth about baptism that we have to unpack. Baptism is not your ticket to heaven. Baptism is not your ticket to heaven. See, the goal of Christianity is not to one day die and go to heaven. The goal of Christianity is to become more like Christ in our actions. Let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, if I decided that I wanted to fly from Sioux Falls, South Dakota to Orlando, Florida, okay? And I don't have to go there anymore. I can just pull up my phone, right? Order my ticket on, on, on my phone. And I book the flight. And I say, okay, I'm going to fly from Sioux Falls to Orlando. I have the ticket bought. You with me? Okay. But if I don't drive to Sioux Falls, go to the airport, go through security, Sit in my little chair until they open the door, give my ticket to the person at the gate, walk in, put my stuff in the overhead bin, sit on the plane. You with me? Track with me? I can't wake up and say, hey, how come I'm not in Orlando, Florida? See, if you buy the ticket, you also have to get on the plane. You with me, church? This is what we have. This is what baptism says. Baptism is a buying the ticket to say, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. But there's more to it than that. It's the rest of our life becoming more and more like Christ. Does that mean you have to be perfect? Absolutely not. Are you still going to blow it sometimes? You better believe it. 
But we're going to recognize that. We're going to try to change. Just as John said, your life should look different. Baptism is not just simply getting wet and going on with the rest of my life. It is an outward symbol of an inward decision in our life and how our life can change. So, if you're here today and you are kind of on the fence about getting baptized, I hope some people in this room might even stand up and say, I'm going to get baptized still today. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should get baptized. Okay? I'm going to try to convince you, and you might want to write these down. There's three very important reasons why I think you should get baptized. Here's the first one. Jesus did it. That's good enough for me. I want to be like Jesus. Jesus got baptized. I should get baptized as well. You with me, church? That's why we should do it. Here's the second reason. Jesus commanded it. Jesus commanded us to be baptized. I'm going to fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry. After his death, resurrection, just before he ascended back into heaven, Matthew gives us Jesus' final words in a sense. This is what it says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the Holy Spirit. That is why when we baptize today, we will say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus commanded us to do it. But here's the third reason. And I think this is the one that we miss sometimes. And, and I want you to get it. Jesus did it. Jesus commanded it. Here's the third reason why we should baptize him. Jesus needed it. Let me unpack that for you. Immediately after Jesus was baptized, immediately after Jesus was baptized, he was led in the wilderness where he was tempted by the enemy for 40 days. He ate nothing and he drank nothing. And he went into to right after he got baptized. Now why do I tell you that? Because when you make the decision, and everyone in the room who stood up, who said they're going to be baptized today, I need to tell you something. When you make that decision, you make that outward symbol of your inward decision, there is an enemy that's going to come after you. He's going to try to seek, kill, and destroy. He's going to come at you and try to attack you. Because he did it to Jesus. He's going to do it to you and I too. And that is why, and I say this with a broken heart. That is why I think so many people get wet and leave and never see them. Because Satan comes after them. And tries to, to disrupt that. Tries to steal that seed away. And we can't do that. See, Jesus knew that to fight the enemy, he didn't have this gift of baptism. He understood that. Following Jesus doesn't mean your life will go perfect. I'm going to tell you, after you get baptized, it might actually get worse. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you otherwise. But it'll actually be better. You know why? Because now whatever you're facing, you're facing the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Which is a much better place to be. That's how Jesus was able to fend that off. That's why you and I can as well. And that's why baptism is so important. So important that if you decide to be baptized, that you commit to being part of this family of church, of believers. We can come alongside you. We can pray for you. We can fight those battles I alongside of you. Don't try to do it alone. Jesus didn't do it alone. He had 12 guys with him all the time. Don't fight it alone. Be there for God to open your life and work through you. Baptism is our death to our old self. We are saying we are dead to our old self and we're being resurrected in Christ. Now, I want to take a moment to explain this to you, um, just because we are a Wesleyan church. This is our church. So I know I talked about why, and I hope you understood the why, but I'm going to take a moment to unpack for you the who. Who can get baptized in, in this church? And this is what how we, we do this. Anyone who has made an outward confession of a faith in Jesus Christ and is committed to an inward decision can be baptized. That's who can be baptized. Now, the number one question we get, and this is kind of the big one, is what about kids? Can kids be baptized? Here's what people say. When children are baptized, what really it is is you're dedicating as mom and dad, as the parents of that child. What you're saying is, I'm committed to raising this child to be like Jesus. And, and, and we hope that one day that child will make the decision on their own. And they'll come back and they'll baptize as well. But that's what we're hoping for as children. As far as the when, when can you be baptized? As soon as you make that decision to follow Jesus, we want you to get baptized. Now, it's kind of hard to do that in January in South Dakota, right? It's a little cold, so that's why we hold these events. So hopefully if you make that decision over the past six months, you say, yes, I want to go and take care of that today. And, and the other thing I wanted to share, and, and I, I missed this at the beginning, but um, if you want to rededicate your baptism, you can do that as well. 
And I don't know if we can go back to those pictures if we can. It's okay. Tom, can we go back to those pictures at the beginning? I missed something. It's our first Sunday here, right? But um, I want to show you this. This is this. March, uh, March of I was baptized as a baby. That's my mom and dad. That's the first United Methodist Church in Gettysburg, South Dakota. But there was a second time, and this is back in March of 1992. This is, you can't see me, but I look really good right there. I'm a 14-year-old awkward kid, right? But as Grace Bible Church, Gettysburg, South Dakota, when I made the decision to get baptized, and, and I said, yes, I, I, I was affirming, I was affirming what my parents had committed to me when I was just a baby. And I was making that decision for myself. And I was saying, now I'm going to affirm that and do that. Please hear this. If you're here today and you were baptized as a baby, you are not stepping on your parents. You're confirming them for them. You're saying, yes, okay, I'm going to affirm what they did for me when I was a baby, and I hope you make that decision. But there's a third picture that I want to show you, and this one is probably one of my favorites. Look at that picture. <laughs> that is in January of 2002, and I love those people on that screen so much because I made a decision as a pastor of this church that I wanted to get baptized again. And I made that commitment. I said, hey, I want to take the lead on this. We did that baptism there in Cheers. It was so much fun to do that. And why do I show you all that? Because, again, I want to tell you again, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward decision. No matter who you are or where you're at in your faith, you can make the decision to get baptized. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is how. We talk about how, right? We do baptism by immersion. What that means is I'll stand next to you, somebody will be on the other side, we'll dunk you in the water, we'll bring you back up. Okay? We do that because we believe that's how Jesus was baptized. Again, I'm not here to argue semantics, but please understand, if that's hard for you or you're feeling insecure about that, we're okay just pouring water over your head, we're okay spraying you. That is okay. You don't have to go under the water. Are you with me on that? Because it's not who that's important. It's not when. It's not how. It is why. Why do we get baptized? Because it's an outward symbol of an inward decision. It's us saying, listen, my life is no longer about me. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me, who gave himself up for me. Doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Doesn't mean your life is going to get better, but it does mean that there's a church here and a group of people who are going to walk alongside you when the enemy comes to attack. And it's going to help you walk through that. And it is the greatest symbol that we can have of our faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for the gift of baptism. Jesus, I thank you that when you came to earth in human skin, you set this as a standard for us. You paved the way as an example of how we should live and how we should function. And God, we think about this, the words of John at that point where John says, listen, Jesus, I should be baptized by you. And you, and you commended him. He said, no, I need to do this too. Jesus, we need to do this well. God, I'm so thankful for the people who stood up today who said they're going to get baptized. And I know that in this room and maybe watch online, there are people that are probably thinking, okay, I need to do that. And whatever fear, whatever barrier that might be in the way, that you would remove it in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would be equipped and empowered by your Holy Spirit to make the public declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord. My life is no longer about me. I'm dead in my old self. I am raised in life in Christ. I'm going to buy the ticket, but I'm going to get on the plane. And I'm going to try to become more and more like you. Jesus, I know that there is an enemy out there who's going to want to just take those people and run through the mirror. But Jesus, you face that yourself. And there's no power that we can't overcome together. And I pray that as a church, we wrap our arms around these people and help them walk through this journey of life together. And one day, you are going to put everything right. But in the meantime, Jesus, there's work to be done. So I just pray that we would fully embrace the gift of baptism and what that means for our faith in you and what that means for the rest of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.